All right, well, I think I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Brianna Berkowitz. I am a professional development assistant with the American Public Gardens Association. And thank you all so much for joining us today for our uh, session on successful ideas, our last idea cafe of 2021. Um, so we have four great panelists with us today and they're really excited to share their stories with you. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Lynn, who's gonna go first today. Um, and thank you all again for being here and um, hope you enjoy. Thank you, Brianna. So for those of you that have never met me, my name is Mary Lynn Mack and I'm currently the Chief Operating Officer at South Coast Botanic Garden located in Los Angeles, California. I also am the president of the American Public Gardens Association Board of Directors. So I'm thrilled to be able to be part of this Idea Cafe. And I want to share with you uh, what really is a pretty novel approach for us at least to introduce people to a public garden, perhaps for the first time. Um, you know, I suffer under no illusion that the program I'm about to show you was very specific to our location and to our partner. And so while I would love if you could duplicate this and want to, it's more about really wanting to encourage you to try wild things and think about what might be, and I hate to use this word, but I will, trending at the time in the hopes of a long lasting connection to a diverse audience who might not otherwise be connected to public, to public gardens and kind of get them in the door through something novel and then connect them to your mission and to the other wonderful things that you're doing, which is what we were able to do with this program. I will now begin by, tell, by asking you, how would a garden watered by music grow? So this is presenting an idea we had called Disco Oasis at South Coast Botanic Garden. And um, as I mentioned before, it was a novel idea, but I wanna tell you a little bit about us first. Uh, we're 87 acres, we're in Palos Verdes Peninsula in Los Angeles County, so not the city proper. Um, and you know, we are a 60 year old garden, but in many ways, I, I talk about us as a fledging uh, garden or a teenager, because we're just now starting to do a lot of the things that make you a true public garden with the programming, um, looking at our collection, et cetera. So we have lots of new, new things to conquer and new things that we wanna do as far as being a presence in the community as a public garden. Um, we had, when I got here a little over two and a half years ago, about 120,000 visitors a year. We're now up to 365,000. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that we never closed down during the pandemic. And when the beaches shut down and other things shut down around us, it really brought an audience to us that, you know, for any other reason would not have come to the garden. Uh, we were the only outdoor venue in a, in a large footprint. Um, and they were really, really thirsty for nature and thirsty to be outside. So we were able to grow our numbers significantly. But the demographic was never diverse. Um, and a lot of that, quite frankly, also has to do with the fact that we weren't on the public garden radar. We were operated a lot as a county park up until about eight years ago. And so we were having a hard time kind of getting on, on the radar or having a reputation as something other than just a grassy place that you could come and have a picnic. So we wanted to change that, you know, and some of the issues here, particularly in LA is, you know, how do you include all of your community uh, when, you've got to make it a compelling enough reason to drive. At the end of the day, this is LA folks and nobody wants to get on that freeway if they don't have to. Everybody wants to do things in their own bubble. And our bubble around us is not diverse. So we wanted to make a program compelling enough to make that drive in the car. Also, we wanted to think about how we could introduce new audiences and not new audiences just to South Coast, but new audiences to the garden world. And so we thought what we'd really do and take advantage of is a way to introduce um, new trends, 
to us and to them and also use an ignored space in the garden. We have 87 acres, a lot of it is not developed. And we currently had a dry lake bed area that is in a long-term plan of uh, renovating and creating a new riparian preserve, but right now it's ignored space. We also wanted to create a bridge between our busy times. You know, we get a lot of our audience in the spring, and then we have a lot of programming and a light installation in the winter. But it's that summertime lull where people are called away to everything from the beaches, you know, to vacations, et cetera. It's a little bit warmer. And we wanted to have those folks that joined us during the pandemic to have a reason to keep coming. Also, we wanted to have something that could generate revenue to build out some of these garden spaces that we were dreaming about renovating. So we created a new experience and um, I'll describe it a bit. So after a really long drought of in-person communal experiences, because LA you know, shut down pretty fast stayed shut down for a long period of time. Um, there really weren't a lot of venues available to come together as a group. And so we wanted to bring something that brought good times, art, lights, disco, and yes, believe it or not, roller skating. <laughs> so we partnered. We partnered with Constellation Immersive. They're an affiliate of Creative creative artist agency. And one of the reasons we were able to partner with them is they came to our light installation uh, last November, December. So we got to know them, we started to talk to them and we really hit it off. And one of the big appeals that we had to them is we had land. And as you know, in LA, that's also you know few and far between. So they looked at this 87 acres as an opportunity that they could partner with a really cool place and, um, and really help actualize this vision that we came up with together. We also were able to partner with Niall Rogers. He's Grammy award-winning composer, producer. He's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as an inductee. And so he was able to kind of bring the music portion of this together. So I know you're still wondering what in the world does this have to do with public gardens? Well, not a whole lot as a straight line, but what it did do was it introduced people, as I said, to botanical gardens for the first time. So I'll tell you a little bit more about it and show you some pictures so you can get a sense of what we were up to. Um, it was a two month run. And basically in that two months, we had 40,000 people participate. Um, and when I say we were able to really branch out to communities that didn't otherwise know we existed or want to drive to come and see us, we had participants, participants come from Hollywood, South Central LA, surrounding communities, as well as as far as Palm Springs and San Diego. What we did was we ended up building um, a 10,000 square foot roller rink in the middle of a dry lake bed. We also put some other amenities around it, as well as um, kind of this very campy take on plants and flowers and melded this really wild thing together of disco music, botanical art and roller skating. Um, so what was also great is our membership grew from 8,000 to 20,000. So that was significant because as you know, when you become a member, you're wanting to come back. And when Disco Ace was, was over and done with, we had just that happen. So significant member growth and repeat visitation. Um, we were able to then take this diverse audience and introduce them to education programming, classes, um, volunteer opportunities in horticulture or as docents and really engage a community that otherwise would not have been coming to us. So some of these pictures I'm showing you are some of the installations as a part of the exhibition. 
So to the left under men, member growth, you'll see something that might remind you a little bit about Madonna. Those were some of the over the top exhibitions that we put together with botanicals, uh, both real and uh, faux, as well as music. And then we had actors involved in all of this as well. So it was a super engaging exhibition. Um, it also doesn't hurt when you're in LA because you can get some celebrity endorsements. So we had quite a few people come out and give us shout outs and that just helped the growth even more. Social media was obviously a big part of this and people were posting their experiences. They kept coming back and they were bringing friends with them. So we not only were able to bring in a diverse audience from a generational standpoint, but we also just touched on every race, every ethnicity, um, as well as a wonderful, wonderful connection with the LGBTQ community here too. So we're beyond thrilled with the folks that we can now call our members and our friends participating in, as I mentioned before, classes, programming, I want to mention that we did a lot of surveys. So people that bought a ticket to Disco Aces, we wanted to find out, okay, why did you come? Uh, you know, why would you come back? What do you want to see that we don't offer? What is it that you want your community botanical garden to give to you in order to engage you and just broaden your experience about public gardens in general? And so as a result of that, we got a lot of really good feedback. And we were able to offer classes that we hadn't before. Everything from container gardening to we did a really cool craft cocktail class. And we also uh, heard from our new audience that they wanted to hear more about climate change. They wanted to take a deep dive with lectures and symposium about the environment. And so we're currently working to partner with UCLA and some other universities here to bring just that to our new community of members that wants more and they wanna get connected to the greater good of public gardens. Um, it also was just community awareness in general. As I mentioned before, you know, we were not on the radar. Public garden, what? They really wanted to look at us more as, that's just another one of the county parks. I can maybe take my kids to run around in the grass or have a picnic. And the community where awareness that such a wild event brought was wonderful because people might have been talking about this good time that they had, but they were also asking about where was this place? Where did this take place and what are they about? So you, we couldn't have bought that kind of community awareness. Um, staff recruitment was another big one. Again, you get people in your space, you teach them about you know, what you're doing during the day after the disco's over. And they reach out in amazing ways. There was staff recruitment. There were people that were saying, well, gosh, how can I get involved? There was huge volunteer growth. And it was just a wonderful opportunity, again, to invite folks for something that was fun, was engaging, kind of allowed everybody to take a deep breath after what was a tumultuous 18 months and come together in a community sense that was just um, celebration. So I wanna show you a little bit of a video, bear with me because this is a long one. So I'm gonna jump to various points of time just so you can get a sense of what the, uh, what the exhibition looked like. And hopefully this will work for me. So I'm going to shoot to the two minute mark because we had some guys just do a tour for us. Okay. All right. Yeah, we could do that. Thank you. We made people walk through the garden because we wanted them to see what they could come back and see during the day, too. Wow, look at this. I'm totally digging it. You know what? We are, so there's, there's people here that, have, like, brought their own uh, roller skates. Yeah, we don't have no, We are noobs here. People are, like, taking this seriously. Look at this one. 
How would a garden watered by music grow? Hey, Arl, are you ready to get lost in music? I hope we can find our way. <laughs> Let's do this. I'm digging the uh, midsummer vibes? I don't know. <laughs> What's over here? Oh, this looks good. Oh, yeah. That right there, no, that's a hat. See ya. Gosh, I feel like these are like parade floats. This totally reminds me of. This is very 80s. Did you hatch from this disco ball? Just gonna show you a few more minutes and then I'll oh, jump oh. forward and show you the roller skating rink <laughs> itself. Thanks. I love the sign here. Disco is a paradise that welcomes all people of every walk of life, always flowing with its ceaseless stream of music, magic, light, love, good times, and groove. Welcome to the Disco Oasis family. Let the good vibes grow. So if you guys ever get confused on when your skate time is, I'm going to skip ahead colors. just so you can and get the gist enter, of it, and like then the I'm going to end so my that presentation. Right there means that we can skate at eight. Check. It got way more cool at night. <laughs> so we'll show you some of the skating rink. We always had volunteers that were professional skaters that helped with part of the engagement. You can see this is a huge production. Like I said, it took 24,000 square feet. 10,000 of that was on the dry lake bed area for the roller rink itself. And we actually didn't disturb any um, of our plants. And the middle of this is a palm tree grove that we built around, which again, you came around the corner and you felt like you were in the middle of an oasis that just happened to sprout forward, we, uh, a roller skating rink. Rain. So I am gonna end this and basically move forward and turn it over to the next presenter. Thanks, Mary Lynn, that looked awesome. Um, John Berryhill from Smith College is our next presenter. Okay, thanks, uh, Mary Lynn, for challenging us to, to think big and creatively. And thanks, Brianna and APGA, for giving us this forum to share ideas and such. I've benefited from it uh, tremendously and I'm grateful for the chance to share the work that my team, uh, including our Smith, uh, our students um, at Smith College are doing at the moment in the last couple of years. So if you're not familiar with the Botanic Garden of Smith College, we're located in Smith, uh, sorry, central to western Massachusetts in the Connecticut River Valley. This is the ancestral land of the Nanatuck people. The uh, Smith College is a women's liberal arts college with about 2,500 undergraduate students, most of whom live on campus housing. And the Botanic Garden is headquartered at the Lyman Conservatory, right at the heart of campus, one of the prettiest spots and radiating out from it is a collection of uh, gardens and accessioned landscape plantings and a campus-wide arboretum. And this summer, Jamila Depewitz Kern, who's a uh, student who's been with us for, she's a senior at Smith College and she's been with us for about three and a half years now and has more than earned the right to call herself a, a partner and member of our team. Uh, she and I partnered up this summer to, uh, as part of her internship project, use the American Public Garden Association Sustainability Index, specifically the employee development, diversity and inclusion attribute that's part of that to measure and assess the successes and failures and progress that we've made since a pivot towards active and engaged idea work uh, about six years ago or so, moving on from a, from a more passive approach to it. And in doing that work, we well it achieved uh, the, the recognition for this attribute through the APGA and the work itself made it clear, in my mind at least, that there's, there's 
two kind of distinct dimensions to this. One is the sort of structural top-down uh, policy piece of this work. And then there's this sort of other dimension that is the sort of the bottom-up face-to-face uh, engagement end of it. And I wanna give you a little snapshot how both of those dimensions of this work are playing out at the Botanic Garden of Smith College. I mentioned on the left side, there are three policies. I don't have a chance to, to show you all three, but I want to give you an invitation to go to our website, garden.smith.edu, or you could just Google these policies, might be a, even a, a, an easier shortcut. But the collections management plan, I'm sorry, our, our five-year strategic plan that was released in 2019 um, was, is available through there. And you can, ex you'll see if, if you explore it, that the priority two is exclusively focused on inclusion and equity work. And you'll not only find the action items that are associated with that priority, but you'll find the language and context that explain why this felt essential and meaningful for us to, to make the, that central to the, the plan itself. And if, if you read, you'll see that priority uh, action item number one is to recraft our mission statement to, to place inclusion and equity at the and experiential learning at the center of our work. And we replaced an old um, uh, mission statement with this one. The old mission statement was much more focused exclusively on botanical education and replaced it with this one that the Botanic Garden Smith College fosters environmental and social justice through teaching and learning about plants, people, and place and um, use that as a, a starting point to ensure that all of our work reflected that ethos. And again, also on the strategic plan, you'll find um, that there's an action item to craft a new collections management plan that we just finished up in the last year. That's the newest of these three uh, that in my mind at least started very much as a curation plan geared towards you know, choosing this taxon over that taxon. And as we work together on a team to to craft it, it became very clear that just the idea that how we build our collections and who we build them for and how they're presented to those audiences and how we take care of those collections are really all the exact same thing. They're all one thing. And that really had to, the, the thinking on this plan had to evolve significantly. And that resulted in a plan that, that did place, um, like our strategic plan placed inclusion and equity at the heart of it, and that is now available on our website as well. So I encourage you, if you've either done work like that and just want to compare your vision of that at your place to our vision of it at our place, or if you're thinking of crafting similar policies or plans or a mission statement for yours, please feel welcomed to explore those documents that are available through our website. And then I'll pivot to the uh, that uh, ground up, face-to-face -face experiential piece of this work and share with you one recent effort that really changed our perception of what relationship building can look like with our audiences and really started with a perception and, and a challenge that came from my, wonder my wonderful colleague, Gabby Immerman, who noted that in an institution, Smith College, where approximately one in three students identify as people of color, we had been operating a summer internship program for over a decade at that point. This is about five, six years ago. Um, and, and recognized that of about 120 student partners that we, we met through that program, exactly three of them identified as people of color. And the fact that that glaring disparity, disparity, excuse me, hadn't slapped us in the face years sooner really speaks loudly to the value of switching from a passive approach to idea work to an active and engaged one. And it was really at the, the heart of this, this uh, effort I'll share with you. And, and also the, the second thing that uh, is very much related, Gabby's also the um, teaches the horticulture classes through the bio department that, that are heavy users of the botanic garden. She noticed the same trend in the horticulture classes and became aware over time that a lot of what was driving the interest of these very popular classes was 
the feedback, the, the, the conversation loops that were happening from students who had wonderful experiences in the class and in the botanic garden and going back to their roommate and to their best butter, whomever, and saying, you've got to take the horticulture class, you've got to check out the botanic garden, you've got to connect with the staff there, you've got to have the internship um, there because they had such a wonderful experience. But these conversations, these little um, self-sustaining fires weren't happening evenly throughout our college community. And we had to be the spark uh, and the bellows that kept that, that, that started and kept those fires going. And in, in that effort, um, Gabby and our new director, Tim Johnson, who had just arrived a couple months sooner, teamed up with Karime Gutierrez, who graduated in, in class of 20. She was another one of our four-year rock stars. And I'm happy to say is now a, a colleague of ours uh, locally. She, she works with the Native Plant Trust, one of our wonderful peer institute public gardens in the Northeast. And they arranged a series of listening sessions with unity organizations on campus that represented students of color. And they, uh, coordinated a, a series of nighttime events in the Lyman Plant House to be fun, to be engaging, to provide these gateway experiences that had not been happening, and also to solicit feedback about the friction and the barriers that had stood in the way, uh, that, had, that had conflicted with our intentions to build an inclusive environment, and also to be willing to hear how our blind spots were, were um, affecting our work and affecting their perception of our work. And they were a tremendous success. They've led to more and more. COVID's made it very hard in the last couple of years to do face-to-face -face events. But uh, we have sustained this effort. We have built this partnership, these partnerships with these organizations. We have learned what it means and to show up for their events. Uh, and in, in doing so, to show up for the people in these organizations. And they've really led to um, meaningful relationships uh, with those groups. And maybe a, a, the best example of this that I'll end up on is, is this slide here that is a breakdown of the self-described uh, racial and ethnic identity of our 10-person intern crew the year after this project started, which stands in really stark contrast to the picture I described from a couple years before that and as we as a professional community are aiming to, Smith in particular, we see it as our obligation to prepare the next generation of leaders in our professional community. And, and we realize that we have an opportunity to create this chorus of voices to, to lend to the complex urgent problems that our um, peer institutions are tackling. So I'll end on that note and pass the baton to Yvonne, but again, just remind, with a reminder of our website and that invitation to uh, check that out and to reach out to me. That's my website. You can also find my contact information for my colleagues at Smith. And again, it's our, our strategic plan, mission statement, and collections management plan uh, that I mentioned before and welcome you to check us out on Facebook and Instagram where we share a lot of our idea work as well. Thank you, and I'll pass the, bon, the baton to Yvonne. Thank you, John. Hi, everybody. My name is Yvonne Garcia Bardwell, and I am the Associate Director of Community Relations at Denver Botanic Gardens. And today I am going to be chatting with everybody about our success story, which is this um, it's a really kind of big deal that we just celebrated um, our 10 year anniversary of Dia de los Muertos here at the gardens. And so I really kind of wanna just kind of tell, talk to everybody about that journey that got us to celebrating 10 years and what we have done to make this a sustainable event within the gardens and what it took to, to create this event. Um, so I'm kind of going to just take you through that journey and talk a little bit about the experience. And, and really my goal is to just kind of, I understand that it may not work for you, but hopefully some of the pieces can work for you. And some of the things that maybe we've done, um, well, you know, you can take back to your institution and, and try. But um, we really started off celebrating this 10 years ago, um, three months into my role at the gardens, I was asked 
if I wanted to help our events team uh, coordinate and, and bring this light, this event to the gardens. And my thought was, sure, I have, I, I can do that. I didn't grow up celebrating Dia de los Muertos. I am from South Texas. We didn't really celebrate Dia de Muertos, but I said, I'd be happy to help in any way that I can. Um, and that was really a very uh, interesting introduction to this event because I didn't have any connection to the community here in Denver. I didn't know who, um, I didn't know who was doing the work. I didn't know who, what museums were out there. So I really just started this event by cold calling people. I uh, started cold calling um, any organization that, that had a Latino name in it and was just given a lot of uh, kind of recommendations or, or help with, you know, just this putting this first year event together. So it started with me saying, we are having this event. This is the date. This is what I need. Can you help? And people were just happy to give me names, recommendations. And so I just started calling and we were able to put on this really amazing event this first year. We had vendors, we had crafts, we had entertainment, um, we had food. And we, um, for the first year event, we had 1600 people show up and that was really, really a big deal for us. Um, so after kind of that first year, I, I said to myself, you know, this really, this really means something. This really this kind of has a, a way to grow. We should be growing this. And I started to think about different ways of doing that. Um, so we kind of just put together this idea of like, okay, where can we, what, what's needed in the community? What, what do we want to do? We want to create access. We want to connect with the Latino community. So let's use Dia de los Muertos as that access, that create that way of, of coming to the gardens. So year after year, you know, we, I would do that. I would continue to reach out to those organizations that I had worked with in the past and asked if you're still available to come to gardens. And it just kind of grew and started growing from there, you know, um, still the same model, still bringing in people. But then we started to incorporate programming. And I started to think about, okay, how can we elevate this just beyond the one day event? How can we educate the communities about this? So we started working with partners. We started to bring in people that could help us, you know, with programming, with, with doing a Sugar Skull workshop. So that way it wasn't just about the one day event, it was really educating the community. And then we started working with K through 12 students and started to bring them in to the mix. And that really opened up a lot in, in this journey, it opened up a lot for me to just kind of do a lot more with the event. Um, I relied on the community to help me with the event, to make it authentic, to make it truly, truly authentic. And it was just amazing to see that kind of like that growth happen um, where it was just a little bit at a time. I didn't do a whole lot in the very beginning, but it was just like a little bit every single year, I would add a little bit more where it'd be programming or a workshop, work with local artists. And then it turned into exhibits. Then it turned into something more than just like with the community, it turned into something that the gardens started to, you know, the department started to help with. They started to see, okay, there's growth here. There's, there, how can we plug in? And that was another big, thing for me is like connecting not only with the community connecting within the gardens to you know staff to to bring this event to life so we started to do exhibits and that helped expand that programming where it was not just about the day of but here we go with a month-long exhibit this is our Nicho's exhibit that we did in 24 no 2016 and that was a really amazing exhibit for me because we invited community members to come and build an altar inside these nichos and we were going to showcase them for a month leading up to the event and that was a really big deal for the community there were so many people who were just so gracious about that opportunity to come and share 
something that was so personal with the world and with our members and with our audience. Like it was just so meaningful that we did this that, that year. Um, we followed it up with another exhibit. The following year, we had these Katrinas that were just amazing to bring again to the gardens, another way to expand programming, another way to kind of keep celebration, to bring more education and, and keep the celebration beyond the one day just to, to have it be something more. And these were very, very popular. These are actually a traveling exhibit now. Um, and that, that to me is just an amazing thing to see, right? That, that an exhibit that we created or started at the gardens was now making its rounds through, through the, through the pub garden um, world. So I love, I love that. Um, so this year we were able to bring in um, another artist and this was the Alebri that we brought in. Uh, we partnered with the Mexican Cultural Center to bring in Alebri him. And again, it was just an amazing experience to see this, I mean, this really just monumental um, exhibit, this art, this folk art here at the gardens in our space, this color, it just, it just was really just such an amazing thing. Um, a couple of things that I just also want to mention about this journey is that it's really important to keep it authentic and to have representation. That was really key for me, is that we always made it about the community and it was about co-creating something with me. And a lot of what I learned throughout the year, throughout the years is that you got to try different things, try something new, try something um, that may sound absurd and but works and just kind of just, you know, go at it from that perspective. You know, here we have, I never I'd see this, but we were, I was able to bring Chavez, which is Mexican wrestling to the gardens. And I, I thought that was the most amazing thing ever just to have something um, this connection to culture in a different way in the gardens that people were able to, to see and learn about and experience. Um, we also have a way for just visitors to be engaged and that's the community altar experience. And to the left, people were able to leave notes for a loved one. Um, we have seen, we've worked with, with um, K through 12 to put on this Nichos exhibit. That was also something that we've done for the past few years. And it was just an amazing experience, again, to have people tell their story or, or just be able to give them this platform and the space to share something so personal for them. Um, and it's just, again, it's grown. Every single year became more and more well well loved and received we've done it a different we've done it different ways where we've had paid admission two years we did um free and that is when we saw twelve thousand people come to this event and that was a really really big big deal for us um we were bursting at the seams it was really hard to manage twelve thousand people but we were really excited about that that just kind of making making that statement within the community that they were welcome here and that they could come to this and feel welcome. That was, that to me was that testament that was, was so great. Um, but this year, what kind of brought us to, to celebrating 10 years, um, something that we were working on is this bringing this folk art to the gardens. And it was through these alebrijes that we brought um, two artists from Mexico City. I was working with them, Oscar and Ruben, and they created these three alebrijes that you see here. Um, and we created programming. I did five nights leading up to our Dia de los Muertos celebration, and we called them Noches Iluminadas. And we had just small programming throughout the evening. It was just entertainment. It was interacting with these alebrijes. We had the vendor, the market, and people just loved it. They really enjoy this experience of connecting with art, with culture, with the community. Uh, it, was, it was a really great experience for us. It was a really great event, five nights leading up to Dia. 
and we had entertainment. Again, we brought in um, working with just people, or, you know, our local our local partners, and just brought in some amazing entertainment. Um, I I've worked with artists as well to showcase their work, and that's also what's made this very authentic throughout the process. Is that I rely like I rely on the community to help me, and we brought in this artist. Uh, his name was Cal Duran to create this space and it's a community altar space and it was just I mean it's beautiful what he was able to put together for us um, we had kids crafts we have these large calaveras that we worked with local artists again to paint for us to be a part of the decor and the celebration was just again well received we brought in over 12,000 people throughout the five nights in Pia. We brought in over $80,000 in revenue, but I also wanna say that we were able to provide community tickets, which I think is really important in, in doing this work. If there's a way to offer free tickets for the community, I think that helps make this event even more special. So we were able to provide 250 community tickets for each night of our Noches Iluminadas and 300 community tickets for Dia de los Muertos. So you're still creating access, even though there may be a paid admission, you're still allowing, you're still bringing in communities by giving them an opportunity to remove that barrier of, you know, the admission piece that they can still come and enjoy this event. And 10 years, it was, it was this year that really kind of brought all of that work over the past nine years, 10 years, eight years, that just made it seem like the community was here. There was more Spanish being spoken in the gardens. Um, just, it was just well, well received by everyone. Very, very few complaints, which is so rare for an event, but it really just was a true testament that we did a really great job. And again, it, it's something that, I have been a part of for 10 years of doing. And I think it's really important to just note that if you're gonna do something like this, that you can do it, anybody can do it, but just make sure that you have that representation, that you have those community partners that you're gonna work with. And it, it really helps you not to think about how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna put this on? How am I gonna make this authentic? If you involve and you make this a co-creation, um, from the beginning, then you can have something very successful that can last 10 years the way this has. And you can start off small and every year just grow it a little bit more and more and more. So I, I leave you with that success story today, um, 10 years of celebrating Dia de los Muertos of the, as, at the gardens. Um, I'm sure I've left out more, but if you have any questions, if you want to talk about how to do this in your garden, I'd be happy to share any of those thoughts, tips, ideas, brainstorm, feel free to reach out at any time um, throughout the year, whenever, whenever you're ready to do something. Um, so thank you all. And I'm gonna pass it on now to Nate to share his success story for the year. Thank you, that is awesome. All right, my name is Nate Kells. I am the membership manager at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. Um, I am going to talk today about a program that we started a few years ago called the Arb Access Program. Um, we, we had a, um, a free, free Monday, then it was free Thursday, and we found that it wasn't really, it wasn't really hitting the target market that we really wanted it to. Um, people were working on those days. It was just a little bit less flexible than we liked. So we met with our, um, let me just go through here quick. So our Arboretum mission is to welcome, inform, and inspire all through outstanding displays, protected nature areas, horticultural research, and education. We, we really focused on was that all, and we looked at it and we thought, well, who are we servicing and how can we service even more people? So the primary goal of the program was to partner with local county service providers to grant free memberships and access to underserved communities through already established government 
eligibility channels. That's a lot to, a lot to get out. But what we really wanted to do is um, we, we had, you know, restricted income, limited income. We had those types of memberships available. But there wasn't really a way to um, to vet that process. And so what we did is we thought, why not work with the local community social workers to do this? Um, because we know that if someone is using their programs, um, their health and human services departments, that type of thing, that they've already been through a process that granted them that access. So why not? grant them the access to the Arboretum. So we reached out to um, our local Carver County Health and Human Services Department first. And these are the objectives that we came up with and that we had discussed with them. So we wanted to provide free memberships to those who may otherwise not be able to afford to visit the Arboretum. We do have a $15 um, entrance fee to the Arboretum and memberships start at $60 for a solo and then go up from there. Um, we also wanted to partner with local organizations um, to use current government set income thresholds to determine program eligibility. This put a lot of the onus on the Health and Human Services Department, which we, were, we weren't quite sure if they were going to be up for it, but they certainly jumped at it. Um, we also wanted to provide outreach to those in the program through partners, such as um, we have a nature-based therapeutics program. Um, we have an extension services that are housed at the Arboretum. So um, we wanted to make sure that we could give access to um, that group also. And to provide information about transportation, we are about 25, 30 minutes outside the metro area. So we wanted to make sure that we had um, partnerships that we could set up with Southwest Transit, which is our busing, um, SmartLink, et cetera. So here is how the process works. I, I just did the um, I just did it very basic, so it could it could be something that anyone could take to their local um, health and human services department. And so each organization will receive printed applications with a specific code. We currently use Altru, um, and so we have everything coded in the system. The numbered applications will be based on the current um, number of clients served by each of um, each of the counties. Applicants will be the only, or applications are the only way that the clients will be able to gr be granted membership. What we wanted to do was simplify the process. Um, we wanted to make sure that even renewals come through that same, um, that same kind of access point. They can be mailed in or dropped off at the Arboretum. The membership and Arboretum staff are not able to renew memberships without the new application. Um, of course, as client financial situations change, if they're no longer eligible for county services, they won't be eligible for the complimentary membership. Um, we did pay and send everyone return envelopes. They were provided. The client organization will need to provide postage and the application is mailed or dropped off at the Arboretum and the client will be mailed new membership cards. So the whole point of this program is to send out membership cards um, in the past, we had um, we had other organizations that we heard of in this, the metro area that would ask for if they wanted to show their SNAP or EBT card. And we just felt like if you're coming out to the Arboretum, we want you to feel like a member. We want you to feel like everyone else that's showing up. We want you to show your membership card. There's no nothing different, nothing. Um, the only thing is in the system, and that's all that membership can see. Um, when the membership is up for renewal, the member will be directed to their county worker to renew through the same channels as the organizational or the original process. Um, county workers should work with each applicant to fill out the form. We ended up in the beginning, we discussed household membership levels. So we have solo for one, dual for two, dual plus two for four. Um, the level would be determined by the number of adults in the household. And then we had um, some people that needed caregivers or assistance transportation. So then they would take that into consideration. This did work, but we ended up deciding this year just to simplify the application to the dual plus two. Um, so everyone is able to bring in that admission for four. Um, so then on our reporting end, the Arboretum provides quarterly reports with generic information to each of the counties. Um, it's just sent automatically through our Altru system. 
and that will determine usage, access, and program validity. So we worked with Carver County first. Um, they're the local county that we are in. They're a smaller county. So we were able to kind of vet the process, get things. We had a lot of, um, a lot of meetings back and forth just to make sure that we were doing what we needed to do. And then we found that there were things that weren't working and it was difficult to get the word out. So we kind of expanded um, within the Health and Human Services Department um, we expanded to the SNAP and EBT program. If they were eligible for those programs, they were eligible for the Arboretum membership. Um, we have the budget membership. We did incur the cost of card printing and mailing. There was some cost incurred for loss of entry fee. Um, but we did have a couple of counties in um, within Hennepin County that asked if we had any um, if we could accept donations from the county. So some of those funds will be used to offset um, the cost of the program. And so then the next steps, we had to determine primary contacts. Um, one of my team members, Johanna, is in charge of um, sending out the applications. We usually do that once a year. Um, right now we've sent out about a thousand applications to 11 different counties. Um, and so we have hundreds of um, members that are using the program right now. The ARB access team will determine return envelopes needed, deliver applications, we do all of that. Um, and so then I have our contact information here if you have any questions. But this is a very straightforward program. It sounds a little bit dry and a little bit um, not super personal, but we it's working and we just needed to make sure that we were able to do something to um, make sure the community can come out. So that's it for me. If you have any other questions. Thanks so much, Nate. And thanks to everyone. That was amazing. So many great initiatives out there. Um, it looks like we have a few questions that have come in. So Anne was asking, I think during, um, Yvonne's presentation about, um, how your events are funded. I have a budget, um, but a, it's a really small budget. So a lot of what I've done throughout the years, because it's just grassroots, I connect you with my community, am able to say, hey, I have space, you have, this, I'll give you free vendor booth space in exchange for that. So it's a, it's been, my, my budget is not big at all. So it has been a lot of that throughout the years. And I think that has made this very, that's what's made this authentic Authentic is because I'm able to give something away that maybe would have cost money. And, and, I, and I, I, that's kind of how I've done it. So it's not, um, it's not a, it has not been a large budget, but just working with community and, and just talking to them about what is needed or what they'd like or how I can maybe give, I'll give you a free membership. And, you know, at this point at 10 years, you know, I do it a little bit, but I, I have a little bit more budget now after 10 years to be able to pay people properly, but I, I still give them something, you know, like a membership or something in exchange for, you know, maybe I didn't pay them enough in my mind. I think, okay, the, the value of what you're giving me, your service is worth this much. I only have this much in my budget, but I'll certainly offset that with this, 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 and this. So um, I, that's kind of how I've, I've done this with my budget throughout the years. Nice. Um, Don's also kind of asking a follow-up about community tickets, like what those are and how they were distributed. So over the years, I've also managed an, a free shuttle program and I've created a partner list. And that partner list, they all received a link to get to access free community tickets. So we were given, um, you know, 1500 was the, or 1200 was the capacity for the Noches Iluminadas. Out of the 1200, 250 we allocated as community tickets. So then I would just email my community partners and say, you have access to tickets to come to any of these events during this week and you, they're free to claim, but you can share this link with your constituents and share with your family members. Um, but they were a part of kind of that general admission. We just took it out of the capacity, the, the the capacity or the the admission tickets. 
Got it. Okay. Um, so you're kind of getting all the questions here right now. Um, Danielle's also asking, um, you said you started cold calling. Is this how you recommend engage to start engaging partners? If you are new, like I was, absolutely. I, Cause I had no contacts. I had no connections. I mean, you could also start within the garden and, and just email all staff and say, does anybody have any contacts at certain organizations? This is what I'm trying to do. I didn't go that route. I, I just did it based just, I don't know why I went cold call, but I just did, but that was 10 years ago. Um, it just seemed to work at the time. I think now I probably would suggest reaching out to staff and, and start there. And then maybe from there, you'll, I think from there, you'll start to get connections and recommendations and resources and things like that. Okay, great. Um, Ashley's asking, how do you balance this event with your GLOW event? Really quickly. Um, it, is, it is a lot of work. We, we meet to talk about the overlap. And um, so the, depart the events team and I, we meet throughout the year and we just, you know, I know where their schedule is production wise and then they know mine. And we just kind of work together around that where they take things down. This year was really, it was so quick where they ended low and, uh, you know, they were taking down that neck on Monday and I was putting up. So like pumpkins were out and, and marigolds were in, and it was just this like 24 to 48 hour process. Um, but it, there was, there's over the years, we've, we've learned how to fine tune that. And, and we really do try to work together because we only have so much space to work with. Um, and, and yeah, it's just kind of communicating and, and talking about it in advance before the event happens. Great, thanks. Uh, Rachel, did you notice any other questions that came I through? I did, yeah. There was a couple for Mary Lynn and one of them was, are you gonna be doing Oasis again? Well, one of the things that we did when we partnered with a Creative Artists Agency is that we wanted there to be value on both sides. And so we are actually in a three-year partnership with them. And the intention was to come up with something creative and innovative um, every summer that they could then turn into a possible traveling exhibition. So we're not gonna have Disco Oasis again, uh, but they are shopping it around to other public gardens and other venues across the United States to see who else might be interested. Thank cool. you, Mary Lynn. And there was another question too for Nate in regards to the membership applications and what type of questions you asked on the application. We don't have any questions we asked because we figure all of that background work has been done by the county. So the application looks very similar to any application you'd pick up at the Arboretum on site. Um, it just has a, a small code in the corner. Um, and the return address information. So I can, I'll add that, I'll add samples of that to my PowerPoint. And then if you guys wanna share that out, you can kind of see what they look like. Yeah, that'd be great. We will definitely be sending out uh, everyone's PowerPoint if, if people are up for that. Um, well, with the absence of any other questions, and as I say that, there's one more. Um, Nate, um, someone's asking if you could say one more time how you engage county reps for the community partnership. Google. <laughs> we literally just Googled um, health and human services. They were the best place to start because they have a lot of social workers that go out into the homes. And so um, we Googled the, the group. And then once you find one, you'll find that there's a whole network. So then ours was Pat Steig from Carver County. And then he just sent us an email that had everyone's, I mean, email address, phone number. He took a lot of time to put it together for us, but he, he saw the benefit and we were able to connect with all 11 counties kind of within our area and then had multiple conversations with those outside of our area just to see if it would be possible um, as far as transportation wise. So that will be our next step. Um, and one more follow-up question um, about how many memberships came from this program, Nate? Um, I think we're at almost 1,200. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. 
All right. Well, we are a little bit fat past four, so I'm going to, I think, wrap it up now. But thank you so much for our panelists. I hope everyone um, got some great inspiring ideas from everyone's presentations today. Um, we will be putting out a great lineup of idea cafes for 2022. So I hope you all can join us then. Um, and just a reminder, you'll get a recording of today's presentation in about a week. Um, sorry again to anyone who had any Zoom issues uh, accessing today. All right. Well, I hope everyone has a great holiday season and thanks so much again. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.